continuing and looking at various ahadith about bad moral values or practices that unfortunately don't just exist amongst non-Muslims but begin to exist amongst us Muslims as well. And we stopped in the hadith of speaking about extremity or going beyond the limits in our deen and practicing or being over worried about other individuals or nitpicking other people's problems or issues or whatever they have carried out inside their lives and exploiting that. Sticking to the theme of extremity that we find is that we find that sometimes among some of us Muslims we find this extreme reinterpretation of the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah and specifically a hadith of the Prophet and people begin to give their own reinterpretation their own understanding which they feel is equivalent or relevant to the modern 21st world and this is dangerous to begin to give a freelance interpretation because of the environment around you to begin to move away from usul and qawaid of ulama of hadith and fuqaha who begin to understand certain ahadith and begin to interpret those ahadith in a certain manner that people then come at a later stage and begin to dismantle that and give their own understanding this is extremity towards the texts of the prophetic traditions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and sometimes this can be done in an innocent manner where the person the faqih makes ijtihad and the person is overlooked regarding this there's been many al-ulama al-ajilla who've made certain stances or certain views which may not confine with the mainstream view of the fuqaha for mathal we find ibn hazm sahib al-muhalla that's why many of the fuqaha they mention take some of his his wordings or his rulings with a with a big pinch of salt because he begins to vary or begin to say certain things which are strange which go against the consensus of the people and that doesn't mean to discredit his knowledge or any alim's knowledge because some of them are going to be mistaken in interpretation even contemporary that we find that certain people went to the view that for example al dhahab lin nisa that gold for women it is haram even though we find that jamhur al fuqaha the consensus of the large portion of the fuqaha islamic jurists and specialists all classify that gold for women is something which is permissible and obviously this doesn't mean that this person whoever the sheikh or the alim may be is being malicious it could be just ijtihad that they derive when they come to a certain a hadith or text that they may come and they read and they begin to give this view what worries and what concerns us is when people come along and trying to appease people just to fit into society they begin to make ta'wilat of a hadith reinterpret a hadith for the environment around them to suit them to please people around them to please non-muslims please people who are secular please people who have a lenient understanding of islam so it fits into the society around them and this is something very dangerous that we should be worried about because not to equate it with this but to help us to understand the sharia of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know for mathal zina is haram on a face value if you ask any individual who is the more severe individual who's going to be punished a person who commits zina or a person who doesn't commit zina naturally a person who said a person who commits zina is going to be under the punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but imagine this in the sharia of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a person who carries out zina and acknowledges that what they're doing is wrong his, his desires overcame him his lust the environment around him and he ya'tarif annaha he acknowledges this is haram this is not allowed in sharia it's a punishable action but he carries out this action equate that to a person ma zana fi hayatihi person never commit zina inside their entire life but he says what is wrong with people committing zina according to the sharia of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most severe in punishment and dangerous individual to society is the person who did not commit zina who believes what's wrong with this action or why are we trying to implement the rules and regulation of person who carries out this action this is what we're trying to highlight that at times that people go to extremities of dismantling things which are well known both will be punished but the one who commits it may possibly and more likely be forgiven by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's acknowledging al-i'taraf bi dham acknowledging his sin whereas the other one is not just going into sin is going into kufr is going into disbelief of rejecting something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out and likewise we find in today's society that we find we don't want to 
uh, be uh, malicious towards any of the society around us. But Muslims need to make their stance clear. A belief which goes against, a practice which goes against our belief, core belief, and goes against the core belief of many of Adyan, many of religions, is what people are trying to push inside society. The society, the environment around us, what they're trying to push inside society, that we need to accept certain class of people and their practices inside society. Uh, imams should take a clear role that it is haram, it's forbidden that these various forms of gender relations being pushed inside society is not allowed. Not to give it a tacit approval or tacit silence and to turn away from it. It's a core element. The imam's role is to let people know, obviously with hikmah, wisdom and fair preaching, admonition, Islam does not stand for this. Islam does not accept these practices. We don't align ourselves with such thought and such practices according to our deen. That's why a Muslim should take a stance. Not to become lenient and say, well, it's fine if people are doing it inside society. It's their choice if they want to do it. Islam remains silent about it or there's no need to say anything. That's not the role of Islam. To just remain silent about munkar or munkarat or fawahish. To highlight to society that we, as a society, we do not agree with it. It is something repulsive and it's a sin as far as the text of the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet is concerned. We don't want to relate today's hadith to such extremity, but we can see that maybe the hadith could lead towards the end result of carrying out some form of zina. We find inside the hadith, لِأَنْ يُطْعَنَ فِي رَأْسِ رَجُلٍ مِخْيَةٌ مِنْ حَدِيدٍ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَنْ يَمَسَّ إِمْرَأَةً لَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ For a person to be struck in the head with an iron rod, with an iron bar, the person may as well take that punishment than to go and to touch a, a, the hand of a woman which is not allowed for him to touch. A woman which is haram for him to touch. Meaning not his wife, his sister, his daughter, his gran grandmother, etc. His aunt, etc. Paternal, maternal aunt. Any other woman for a man to go and touch her, he may as well have this iron rod struck in his head. Hadith has been collected by Imam Tabrani and Imam Al-Bayhaqi. Now we find that according to this hadith that we find that some individuals they want to throw doubt upon this hadith. This hadith has been checked by late Sheikh of Sham, Sheikh Nasruddin al-Albani rahmatullah alayhi, inside his silsala. And likewise, a contemporary muhaddith that we find, Sheikh Mustafa al-Adwi of Misr that we find, has authenticated this hadith who is living today. And those who want to throw doubt upon this hadith, they say that this hadith is mawquf. That is, this hadith stops at, at al-Sahaba. But we find that there's other narrations or other supporting evidence we're going to come to from the practice and the life of the Prophet alayhi wa which make all of this Plausible. And as we find that mawquf in the hatta al-ulama al-hadith that we find mustal hadith where you look at al-ba'ith al-hadith, ba'ith al-hadith of Ibn Kathir or Muqaddama Ibn Salah to study the meaning of mawquf. Yusammunahu al-athar. That statement of, of, of the companions is classified as athar which is close to being the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it becomes something which is acceptable. Ayyhal, that's a technical study which doesn't concern us moment in time. But some of the shubuhad. So that's the first shubha regarding the authenticity of this hadith. The second thing that they say that the hadith means that a person can touch an elderly woman and not a young woman. If you look, read through the works of the fuqaha, there was only one madhab or some ulama amongst that madhab who said that to touch the hand of an elderly woman is allowed. Amma al-baqoon, as for the rest of the fuqaha, they said there's no difference between a young woman and an elderly woman. It's not allowed to shake the hand of any woman. So there's only a minute view amongst books of fuqaha that some have allowed it for an elderly woman. But a majority of the ulama, a large portion of the ulama, have forbidden for a person to stray, shake the hand of any woman, whether it be a young or an elderly woman that we find. Another shubha that these people that they bring, if it contains shahwa, raghba, desire, a need, a feeling. If, if it entails that, then it becomes haram. How can a person engage? What is raghba? What is shahwa? How can a person have a parameter, have a level of judging that whether this was out of desire, not out of desire? هذا سر الغيب عند الله سبحانه وتعالى لا يعلمها إلا الله سبحانه وتعالى No one knows that except for Allah سبحانه وتعالى so for to say to people that if, if you don't have a desire and you shake a person uh, opposite gender's hand, it's permissible. 
is another shubha that they try to begin. Another shubha that they say is mashe means it means zina. The hadith is speaking about is not allowed to commit zina ma ajnabiya. That's what it's highlighting because the word mas. But as we mentioned, majority of the ulama of al hadith yaqulun ta'khud kalimat ala zahiriha. Take the words upon the apparent meaning because there's no proof to highlight this means intimate relationship. The meaning here is open. That's the text of Ahlul Sunnah to take it apparently. It means not to touch the hand of a woman or touch a strange woman. So that's how we take it. We don't delve deep into how they try to interpret it. It means to carry out that action that we find. But if we look at the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we state that you can touch a woman when the Quran says that you cannot even look at a woman? So how is it plausible? The Quran says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ That is better for them. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ أو وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ Say to the believing men to lower their gazes. So, an nadr, or nadratu ila al-mar'at al-ajnabiyya la yajuz. So if you're not allowed to look at a woman, فَمَا بَالَ الْمَصَّ الْمَرْعَةَ So how is it allowed to touch a woman? Quran says don't look at a strange woman. And even inside here, if you look at, read this ayah, you study this ayah in great detail. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say to the believing men, men, مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ تَبْعِدِيَ بَعْدْ As Imam Shanqiti, the son of Sahibu Adwa' al-Bayan, making tafsir, Imam Tabri, he mentions of this ayah, مِنْ Because why at times the glance could fall upon a strange woman. So look how daqiq the Qur'an is. It doesn't say at all times that your glance should be shied away, should be turned away. It can at times fall upon a strange woman, a person looks away. But it, when, it, when it mentions, وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ Qur'an doesn't say, وَيَحْفَظُوا مِنْ فُرُوجِهِمْ Qur'an doesn't say that at some time guard your chastity. Qur'an says, وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ دَائِمًا أَبَدًا Preserve yourself, protect yourself. That maybe the glance may strike the individual it may happen the human being so the Quran is is realistic it is a living book as they say it speaks about human beings it relates to their, their daily lives when people say the Quran isn't equivalent to today's world the things it speaks about it doesn't understand human nature doesn't Allah know what he's created the most subtle the most aware Allah begins in Surah sort of Al Imran speaking about Zuyina li nasi hubbu shahawat. The most covetous greed and love of desires begins with what? Allah mentions an nisa. Limada. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin with women? Why doesn't He subhanahu wa ta'ala begin with the other things? These are all evidences to understand, to prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the nature of the human being, what He's created. Inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'oon. Allah knows whatever that you carry out or whatever you want to do. The reason why such practices could become applicable or people begin to do these actions inside our society is possibly albi'ah, the environment around us. The environment around us, it begins to drive in that this is something which is acceptable, something where we may have existed in a life before, an environment before, when we come to a new environment, everybody's doing this action. So we find that the environment around us that for non-Muslims, for them to shake the hands of the opposite gender is a common practice. It's something, the usual practice that they do. Or, but even if you look at non-Muslims, you have to give them credit. That if you read about what they speak about entering into Muslim lands, and you read through their, their travel guides, they write inside, they don't shake the hand of the opposite gender. Unless they offer their hand to you. Don't, it's, it's, it's offensive. Don't sit with a strange woman on the bus, on the train. Don't speak excessively with a person of the opposite gender. This is what they write when they travel through our lands. So they know our bi'ah, they know our environment, they know our logic, they know our deen, they know what we practice. But the strange thing is that we're very, we're very quick to forget our own teachings when we come inside such environments. Or some people say the, the greater good, the political environment around us. That we've got other things to worry about. So so what if someone shakes the hand of, an, of, of a woman? This is maslaha 
This is benefit for society around us. Maslaha, who weighs up what is maslaha? What is benefit? I feel it's my benefit that in my workplace I could lose my job. I could be frowned upon. I could be looked down upon. I could be ostracized inside my environment. I could lose my job, lose my earnings, can't take care of my family. So maslaha for me is that if my manager is, is a female manager, I shake a hand if she offers a hand. So how do we weigh it? What is maslaha? Maslaha isn't for any individual to decide themselves. Maslaha is, is lajna, idara, ulama, fuqaha, a body, consensus, who begin to see what is, see what is maslaha, what is mafsada, and weigh it out, then give a ruling. Not for any individual to come along and to pluck at the shi sharia, pick it up on their own accord and say, this is maslaha to nas. How the maslaha li nafsik? This is a benefit for your own self, not for the, for the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even historically that we find, the shaking of hands that we find in the political world that we find, you know, the, the hand of the, of the queen, no one is allowed to shake her hand. No one is allowed to shake her hand unless she offers her hand. It is offensive for you to try to shake her hand unless she offers her hand. Obviously, there is a, a religious connotation you study deep into history because they believe that their rulers, they were gods. That's what they believed. So you can't shake the hand of their gods, their leaders. So you have to, that's what you find, you have to bow in front of them, give courtesy in front of them. This is where it all stems back from, even though today they don't believe that they're gods, but this is the historical aspect amongst them. That's why you find even in Sharia, look how the Prophet ﷺ, which is more important than this, he, 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 he reviled a person who wants to fight, 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 is proud that people stand up for him. And if a person feels that they, people need to stand up for them, then no way should a person stand up for that person. No one is saying that we shouldn't show respect to people in authority, to ulama, to elderly people, etc. But if the person is arrogant and wants people to stand for them, and has this parade, has this charade, has this, wants this to people to do, then a person may as well sit down. A person doesn't need to stand up for no human being. Doesn't need to stand up for them. That's what our Sharia teaches us, because why? This over-reverence of mankind, of human beings, and this arrogance that people have, that people should do this in front of them, is something the Sharia came to dismantle what these people have. Likewise, we find all do it. Sad amongst even us Muslims that we find that Muslims will, will shake hands with the opposite gender, inside the work environment, inside the, the, the environment around them, even family members. They will do it. And even practicing Muslims, they think nothing of it. And this needs to be removed from our society. That if, if practicing Muslims are carrying out such actions, what does it show to the masses of people? If so-called practicing Muslims are, are engaging in texting, in messaging, in exchanging conversations amongst one another, for what purpose? This is all dangerous. This is all something which is detrimental that we find. And then we find the other sad extremities we mentioned, that there are such ulama, who obviously a minute amount, who justify this action. Who say that they will shake hands of, of a woman and they find nothing wrong with it. Even though this is a, a very, very minute percentage. But this is the danger that we're trying to highlight. That this is such a minute percentage. If it becomes well known inside society. And they have a large following. And they endorse it. And they practice it. Then it becomes something which is common. Because you find that awam, mass of the people, are, are weak in general. In the sense that they don't have a deep understanding of texts of Nasus. So people that they look up to, they begin to give these views. They quickly flock towards it. And begin to practice it inside their lives. What we should remember about such things. Inside the hadith that we find in a Muslim, every child of Adam has his fair share of zina. Every child of Adam, son of Adam, has his fair share of zina. The hadith mentions the eyes, zina of the ain is, a, is looking. The zina of the tongue is speaking. The zina of the hand is touching. And the zina of the legs is walking. And then you find that the hadith continues that this then leads on the person, be these private parts testify to that, or they go against that. Why are such harsh kalimat words used inside this hadith? If it's something which is trivial, why is the Prophet ﷺ mentioning that every son of Adam has his fair share of zina will be written upon that individual? And that's what we find, even though these, these could be minor sins that we find. As the Quran mentions, الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشَ إِلَّا اللَّمَمِ those who stay away from the major sins except for the minor sins. But as we know, according to other texts of the Quran, that certain minor sins, if they lead towards something which is haram, it becomes detrimental. When the Quran mentions, Wala zina, innahu kana wasa sabila. 
Quran says, Wala taqrabu. Quran doesn't say, Wala taf'alu. Wala taqrabu. Saddu dhari'ah, saddu al-abwaab. Closing every single door, every single path that leads towards zina is haram. And that's why you find even if you read the, the studies of, of human beings about relationship between men and women that you find they speak about the sensual touch. Of the touch of the man of touching a woman. It can, as you find, it can lead towards something else that we find, stimulants that we find as other ulama of hadith have even mentioned. Explain this hadith, the stimulants that lead towards something which could end up being something which is haram for that individual to do. And the evidence for this is inside the Quran. That a person that glancing at something or doing something, they could become overcome. And the environment around them could lead them towards something which is not saying that every individual go and commit zina. That's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say to preserve ourselves. And evidence inside Surah Yusuf is, is a prime example of that we find the wife of the Aziz. Qad shagafaha hubba. Inside the verse 44 of Surah Yusuf that we find. Qad shagafaha hubba. Hubban. That you find that the, the, the ulama of Logab described that love went right deep into the core of her heart. And overcame her. She was covered with, with passion and desires by just looking at being in the, in the suhbah, the companionship of Yusuf alayhi salam, who's been given shatrul jamal, nisful jamal. Half of beauty was given to him. That's what you find that when the, when the other women began to blame her for what is, what is this she's doing? Advancing herself upon you know, her, her, her own slave or boy inside her own home. So when Yusuf alayhi salam, when he came out, they said, this isn't a human being. This is Malak. This is an angel. And you know, the, you, we can't blame the, the wife of the Aziz, what she done. And then you find that, if you read some works of Tafasir, that they, when they, 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 they slit their wrists. Ammal kinaya, as it, they just, they went to extremity. And some of the, the Mufasir mentioned that physically, they were, each one of them, as I mentioned, were given knives and given fruits or whatever. They, they forgot about what they were supposed to slit and they began to cut their own selves. Whatever it means, it shows extremity. That it led towards that evil result that we find of what she was trying to do. Look at the seer of the Prophet ﷺ. We find, Inni la usafihun nisa. He said, I don't shake hands, I don't greet hands with women. This is our role model, this is our qudwa. I don't shake hands with women. Our mother Aisha, عنها, she narrates inside a hadith, Wallahi ma masat yadu yarsul, Rasulullah sallam, yada imra'atin qat. The hand of the Prophet sallam, never ever touched any woman. Ma kana yubayi'unna illa bil kalam. He used to take the pledge from them except for via speech, the qawl. This is what Aisha she narrates about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that's what we find if you look at Surah Al-Mumtahina, which is relevant to this, the 60th chapter that we find, the women who are tested, Ya nabiyu, ida ja'aka al-mu'minat, yubayi'naka ala alla yushikna billahi shay'a. When the believing women, they come, and they give that pledge to you, they're not going to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala yasriqna, wala yazneen. They're not going to steal, and they're not going to carry out any zina. إِلَىٰ قَوْلِهِ سُبْحَانُ تَعَالَىٰ فَبَايِعُنَّا وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُنَّ اللَّهِ Accept their pledge, take their pledge, and then seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these individuals. هُنَا نَقِفْ إِلَىٰ هَذِي الْكَلِمَاتِ وَلَا يَزْنِينَ That they don't, do not commit zina. Imam Suyuti inside his tafsir al durul al-Manthur. He mentions Hind, Imra'a, Abi Sufyan. Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, she mentions, قالت, أتز, You know, sometimes we speak about the Quraysh having these extremities of, of performing tawaf around the Kaaba in a state of nudity, not respecting women, doing this and doing that. But at the same time, they had other, other actions that you find that showed they were noble people. Other actions. She said, أَوَتَزْنِي الْحُرَّةِ This is Hind, Imra Abi Sufyan. She says, does a, does a free woman, does she carry out zina? Does she do this evil action? لَقَدْ كُنَّا نَسْتَحْيِي مِنْ ذَلِكْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ فَكَيْفَ بِالْإِسْلَامِ She said, in jahiliya we felt ashamed about it. We avoided it. We stayed away from it. 
We found it repulsive. We were shy about it. So why are you telling us about we should, we should take this oath of staying away from zina now that we enter into Islam? We never done it then. We're not going to do it today. This shows, this shows moral fiber inside society that even they could be doing certain other actions they could be doing inside their lives. But there was a moral element that maybe some of us will begin to fail to understand inside our lives. Returning back to the life and the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If there was, and obviously using the word if in capital letters that we find, if it was allowed for any individual to touch strange women in the sense of trying to help them or to aid them or even to take the pledge, it would have been allowed for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Being the messenger of Allah, being the Prophet of Allah, being a fatherly figure, being a leader amongst the society, etc. If it had been allowed, he would have carried out that action to show society. But obviously the foresightedness and seeing that what it could lead to, how people could interpret it, he avoided that. And thus we find that the Prophet ﷺ, he had opportunity to help other people inside society. But look how he conducted himself and look how the companions themselves understood their relationship with the Prophet ﷺ and the environment around them. We find that Asma bint Abi Bakr, Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, the sister of Aisha, is married to the Prophet. She was married to Az Zubair ibn Awwam, one of the Ashra al Tul Mubashara. Ashra, the ten who have been promised paradise upon the blessed tongue of the Prophet. And she narrates that, you know, we weren't very rich. Very poor individuals I had to go and work in the fields of, 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 of Zubair. I had to go out and work in, in, in the field and collect the date palm stones and carry them and, and bring them back. So one day I was, as I was carrying the jugs or the, the, the baskets of these date stones, I'm coming back. And she sees a, a group of men riding towards her, coming towards her. Because she had to travel some two to three miles outside of Medina to go to the orchard, go to the area to carry this. She sees the Prophet, he sees her. And he tells one of the camels to kneel down for her to, to sit down, ride upon the camel behind, behind them. She refuses because she remembers the ghira, the sense of shame of her husband, Zubair ibn Awam. That he wouldn't approve of me riding behind, behind these, these men in this manner. It even happens with the Prophet. The Prophet, he noticed that. He noticed that, so he just let her be and they carried on riding. So when she meets her husband, she narrates this, that today I saw the Prophet he's riding with his comrades and he offered his riding beast to me to ride behind them. He could have assisted her, he could have helped her. But you, you find that, look at Zubair al-Awwab, even though he had this sense of ghira that he had. He mentions, Wallahi lahamliki an-nawa, for you to carry these date stones. Ala that was more shameful for me. More disgraceful for me if you'd been riding behind their back. Riding behind another camel between them. For him to see you in that manner of what you're doing. But what we're trying to extract is a, is a sense of, of ghira. Of, 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 of ghira that we find. The right ghira of shamefulness for one's family members. That you find. That's what we find in the hadith. Kalimatu shadida. The youth la yadkhulu jannah. The youth la yadkhulu jannah. Read what ulama mentioned about what is the meaning of the youth. A shakhs alladhi la yahtam bi ahlihi. Person who doesn't care about their family members. Who they mix with, who they speak with, how they dress, how they entertain themselves, what they look at, what they do. Especially the, the women folk. Harsh kalimat. The youth la yadkhulu jannah. A person should be worried about the environment. We shouldn't just be just the freelance inside society that we find that everybody greets, everybody, everybody meets, everybody. La, la yadkhulu In the shari'atina, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we find in conclusions we began with the extremity that a person may have regarding his views and the other extremity of the person of accidental weakness. A man has been created inside a state of weakness that person, a woman could thrust out a hand, a person could forget, shake a hand, out of weakness may do it. We acknowledge that as human beings. We're not there here to compartmentalize people and send them to Jahannam and to punish them. We understand that as human beings. 
where you're trying to send out the message is people trying to justify actions to play with the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to legalize it and to think nothing of it. But as a human being who has a weakness, who may do it, who makes a mistake, who forgets at a moment in time, is something that Islam is tolerant towards that. The spur of the moment or the iman is weak, they may go and carry out that action. And thus we find that person should not, should try to develop to develop the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what a person should, should pray. Not the fear of people. When a person develops the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then a person is overcome from the fear of people and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we need to develop inside our lives is fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that the environment around us dictates to us of what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and when it suits them. Muslim tries their best at whatever environment that they are in, they try to uphold themselves to the best of their ability to the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is what helps shines out. Inni la usafihun nisa. This is what shines out about the Prophet alayhi shines out. That's why Muslim as well, we shouldn't give mixed messages. A Muslim should shine out. These are characteristics of Islam, of Muslims, of good practicing Muslims. This is what their, 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 their good culture is, Islamic practices are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and ability to hold fast to the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, not place us inside any form of fitan, ma dhahara minha wa ma batan, whereby we have to compromise our deen or we become weak and begin to may carry out some practice which against the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to conceal our shortcomings, our sins and our mistakes and, and shroud them inside this dunya and more so in the day of judgment whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he shrouds your sins inside this dunya, he will shroud them in the, in the, in the he hereafter. Or we'll ask the person that did you not do this, did you not do this? And whoever acknowledges that and, and feels remorseful and regret and acknowledges that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe away the sins of that individual. Will wipe out their sins and turn them into good deeds.